наша акция была исключительно мирной и ненасильственной. Мы сформировали переговорную группу, которая намеревалась провести переговоры с руководителями силовых структур. Тем не менее, к площади независимости были стянуты войска спецназа, внутренние войска ОМОН. Все они пошли в наступление. Толпу стали рассекать, стали избивать. Мой муж Андрей Санников сильно избит. Мне тоже досталось, к счастью, не, не так сильно. Мы сейчас едем в, в травмопункт. Ой, извините, нас останавливает машина ГАИ. К нам прижаться к обочине. Так, похоже, нас будут паковать сейчас. Пакуют. Ой, меня вытягивают. Меня вытягивают в травмопункт. Вы что? Что вы делаете? Так. Так. Стою, как в американском боевике меня при... прижали. В машине тут лежит на земле. Уроды! Суки! Фашисты меня бьют по лесу! Руки залазывают! When there is no value in your father's life, it is, it is maddening, to be honest. It is really maddening. He murders people, he kidnaps people, he arrests uh, everybody who goes against him, and I can't believe that the world lets him get away with it. Fantastic younger son with a very good stop making face, this silly youth. Who is who's been very supportive and who's been very good at feeding, feeding us as well as everything else. So he is cooking today, he is the main chef today. So if anything is Every not nice, it's I his fault. Poisoned. <laughs> if everything is great, it's to my credit. <laughs> Irina Bogdanova is originally from Belarus. She has lived in the UK with her husband, Tony, for 18 years. But in 2010, their lives were turned upside down. Irina's brother, Andrei Sanikov, was a candidate in the Belarusian presidential election. He was imprisoned along with his wife, Irina Kalip, after a violent crackdown on the country's opposition. Irina Bogdanova's home in southern England has effectively become a refuge for those who managed to escape. House is a very much a refugee camp. It's like suitcases everywhere, the, you know, the stuff is everywhere. People are going, coming, going, sitting on the computers. Everybody's kind of into their computer doing their bit of work, which is bizarre in all honesty. People so isolated um, in terms of information in Belarus that it, you can compare it to prison, and that's why now Actually, quite often when I give interviews, I do say that it's not my brother that is imprisoned. It's 10 million people that live in prison. And because it's information prison, it's a human right. Rights are violated on every level. And okay, they live in their own houses, but they don't have freedom. Irina Bogdanova is an acupuncturist, but since her brother's arrest, she's been thrust into the limelight to try and secure his release. I want some knight in shining armor to you know, ride to Belarus and open the doors of the prison, but that's a fairy tale. Today, Irina's at the British Foreign Office to meet the Minister for Europe. 
Lobbying politicians and talking to the press have become routine since her brother's arrest. And it's not always easy. I feel when you're communicating with the, you know, ministers of foreign affairs and um, presidents and diplomats and, and just Andrei's friends on whatever level they are and everything you... I felt that I need to be in my best and, uh, and, and deliver the message that I needed to deliver and uh, get them to, to kind of realize how much help we need, he needs. Um, and I couldn't even think straight, let alone, you know, get engaged with people and everything. And it's just felt that I'm letting him down. In Britain, people know much more about what's happening in um, Ivory Coast than Belarus, when Belarus is next door and Ivory Coast is who knows where. And I, I don't understand why, but that's the situation. Belarus is a country of 10 million. It lies between Poland and Russia, with the Ukraine to the south and the Baltic states to the north. Alexander Lukashenko has ruled this former Soviet Republic with an iron fist for the past 17 years. His authoritarian style has earned him the nickname of Europe's last dictator. For many, he is a figure of ridicule, but his grip on power is real and terrifying. The headquarters of the state security service, still called the KGB, dominate the Minsk skyline, just as its officers rule Belarusian society. There's no free speech. The media is almost entirely state-run or heavily state-controlled, and internet usage is restricted and monitored. Lukashenko controls almost every aspect of life here. Any opposition is firmly dealt with. Foreign journalists are not welcome. <laughs> Most of this film has been made undercover. In December 2010, Belarus held a presidential election. But Belarus is democratic only in name. Lukashenko was standing for a fourth term in office. He's ruled the country since 1994, and over the years has steadily tightened his grip, manipulating parliament and brainwashing his people with propaganda. In 2010, Lukashenko was declared the winner of the election, even before the polls had closed. International observers described the result as flawed, just as they had done in previous years. So this came as no real surprise. Vote rigging has become almost common practice for Lukashenko. <laughs> It can often appear that time has stood still in Minsk. The grand boulevards, which are often very empty. The intimidating and oppressive architecture, which dwarfs the people that live here. It's all very reminiscent of the Soviet era, and people shiver when you mention politics. Nobody dares talk out of line. 80% are employed by the state here, and even in the small private sector, the state has the biggest influence. So going against the regime means losing your job, losing your livelihood, putting your whole family at risk. Yet on the night of the presidential election, it looked like people had finally had enough. Tens of thousands came onto the streets to protest against the vote rigging. This was the largest demonstration Belarus had ever seen. <laughs>
Andrei Sanikov has been a critic of the Belarusian regime for some time. Speaking six months before his presidential campaign began, he was well aware of the dangers involved in going up against Lukashenko. It's not easy, it's not safe, but uh, it, it's my country, so I have to speak. Exposure is some kind of protection. Because I don't hide and I don't uh, really uh, speak double language. Uh, uh, they know my views and I, I, I keep these views and I stick to these views. I'm four and a half years younger, so I always was under his feet. And so I was kind of chucked out of the room. And um, because I was very, being a girl, I was very nosy. I needed to know everything what was going on. And they, big boys, they didn't want me around. So I was constantly locked out. And <laughs> normally he is the... He is a very sort of domesticated, very, um, in a way, quiet person, which is difficult to believe seeing him as a political leader. He is very, you know, determined, very forceful and energetic and everything. And he is. But at home, he is, um, he loves picking mushrooms, he loves just walking in the forest, he loves cooking really likes inventing recipes and things like that. It was exciting because a lot of people gathered on the streets and a lot of people supported um, the democratic movement and wanted to see Belarus free and wanted to see fair elections and everything. So it, it was very exciting. Um, and that atmosphere of, of basically celebration on the streets. Opposition parties joined forces and gathered outside parliament. Spurred on by the large crowd, they called for talks with the government and demanded a second round of the election. Lukashenko has lost and now he is using force to stay in power. That's the only reaction. They wanted to negotiate with the existing government uh, and achieve some sort of agreement, obviously peacefully, normally negotiate. But it soon became clear Lukashenko was not willing to listen. And then all of a sudden they started to attack the crowd of people. resistance people were not armed and and it's just despicable what happened Human beings don't behave like that. It's even animals don't behave like that. Andrei was beaten up, 
uh, badly to the point that he couldn't get up. And then I think it's only a few days later I've uh, discovered that um, they, how badly he was beaten up and um, that, you know, that this riot police shield was put on him and, and police right police was jumping up and down on him and, and obviously causing huge damage. And I've seen photos of him lying on the ground. It is just so horrible, so brutal. Vladimir Neklaev is a famous Belarusian poet. He also stood against Lukashenko in the election of 2010. And like Andrei Sanikov, he paid a heavy price for it. He was targeted by security forces as he and his team made their way to demonstrate against the vote rigging. We were gathering together with our activists near our office. And then the idea was to go from the office to the central square, where supposed to be uh, the main uh, meeting. It was a, a road police car that crossed the road and stopped the stop us. It was like suddenly we see we saw uh, people in black masks who just simply jump to the people. They beat Nikolaev very bad. I mean, extremely bad. He even didn't have a possibility to stand up. So, and he looked, we, we just, you know, pray that he alive. I learned what inspiration means very, very early in my childhood, because when the inspiration stuck my father, he would just, you know, stand up, whatever he's doing, and just leave and, and go start writing something. You know, it's a pleasure to work in the arts and in the children because you don't know, have the state support system, uh, you don't have censorship. Um, because we, uh, when I was working in, uh, in Belarus, in Minsk, first of all, um, I started the censorship committee around that time when I started my professional activities. So you had to submit a list of uh, works that you're going to, for example, when you're organizing an exhibition, you had to submit a list of works with all the pictures to the censorship com committee so that they would, you know, approve that the works are not in any way um, considered to be either political or, you know, critical of the regime. <laughs> They lie us to the ground, and a uh, few times they beat Nikolaev. We took Nikolaev and brought him to our office, and then we called to, to the medicine and came and took Nikolaev to hospital. And uh, then he, like, disappeared. When he was arrested, he was basically kidnapped from the hospital. And when we found out that his prison it was actually good news for us, you know, at least he's alive. Hundreds were arrested that night in Minsk, and many more were detained in the days that followed. The KGB used telephone records to trace each and every person that had used their mobile during the protest. 
People were locked up or issued fines and placed on a blacklist. With virtually all members of the opposition behind bars, including Andrei Sanikov and Vladimir Neklaev, it fell to their families to take on Lukashenko and get them released. Irina and Yeva, who had never been that interested in politics, were turned into the public faces of the Belarusian opposition overnight. It went very well. Baroness Ashton came to talk to myself, first of all, and Eva Nikolaeva to express her sympathy with um, members of the families of those detained and um, at the outrage and the shock of, of the whole European community. I passed the petition from the committee with Valenia, um, which is uh, relatives of all detained, and yeah, she accepted it and uh, yeah, expressed every hope that it will be sorted out very quickly. I would like to thank for this opportunity to raise my voice and to give a voice to all the relatives of uh, the prisoners of consciousness now uh, who are sitting in prison in Belarus. So what we say is that uh, if you are not interested in politics, politics will get interested in you. It's, uh, it's not just the new skill, it's the whole <laughs> set of skills I'm developing. I never spoke uh, publicly, I never... I don't remember myself being on the camera, I never, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a very private person and, and it doesn't come easily, but yeah, it needs to be done, so there is no options. <laughs> Reliving the night of the election gets no easier for Irina or Yeva. But what started as a campaign to release their relatives has turned into a political fight against Lukashenko himself. Remember Hitler. Hitler is Lukashenko's hero. If we don't stop him now, he should have been stopped ages ago, but if we don't stop him now, it will affect every one of you. I'm absolutely sure of it. Ты же мужик, чего ты прибежал, рыдаешь в этой больнице? Ну что дали по голове? Ну и что? Они еще хотели быть президентами. Какой ты президент, если тебе по морде дали, и ты вопишь на весь мир? Вешь камеру, блядь! Выключ камеру, блядь! Да помогу, Зарычок да, слава тебе! Да, Зарычок да, послабить! Телефонить! Так, блядь, в офис! When you hear that someone doesn't value life of your father at all, when there is no value in your father's life for this person, how um, is, it is maddening, to be honest. It is really maddening. Irina, she's the only one who actually knows what I'm going through, what my family is going through. And, uh, and we, uh, in this situation, uh, communication with, uh, 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 between the relatives of, of the political prisoners is extremely important because you sort of, you don't really have to say anything, you know, you just know what what's the other person is going through. It's, it was very nice to meet her, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's that comfort in a way in, in being able to share. Uh, it's just even talk, just, just be with the person who knows how you feel, it, it's very comforting. Yeah. Website, it's Free Belarus now, was set up um, by mostly the relatives of the um, imprisoned in Belarus in the support of, of them and um, to raise public awareness. If I start thinking about how he is there, I definitely 
I just wouldn't be able to, to carry on fighting because I'll just I'll just fall apart. I, I've let it happen a couple of times and it's it's just unbearable. I I stop sleeping, I stop eating, I just don't function. Especially and especially if, if you wake up. Sometimes last thing at night is not that bad because I'm exhausted by then, so I just zonk and I sleep. If I wake up or some, something wakes me up during the night, that's the worst time. You just really need to work really hard not to, not to allow these images to flood in. So I'm trying to, when I imagine Andrei and when I sort of try to talk to him and everything, I imagine him in a, like when we were on holiday you know, in a nice and happy environment and when we've done nice things together rather than him being in prison. If you could talk to him, what would you say? What would be the first thing you could say? That I'm extremely proud of him and I love him very much. It's perhaps ironic that Andre and his wife Irina Kalip were stopped and arrested here on Victory Square on the night of the election. They'd been brutally attacked outside Parliament, and this man, Ilya Kuznetsov, came to their aid. And I saw Sannikov and his wife leaving the square as well, actually trying to escape from police. He was uh, in quite a bad shape. His, his bodyguard was pulling him from the square, so I thought his legs were broken or something, he couldn't walk at all. Uh, when he was trying to say he was badly hurt, he couldn't even talk, he was so, in so much pain. As he was uh, with his wife as well, Irina, she was crying, shocked. We first, I first heard the sirens, and then saw in the rear view window and saw the flashing lights. The arrest itself was quite violent. Irina was giving an interview to Radio Echo Moskvi at the moment of the arrest, so, so it actually happened live. So they stopped me here and then ran to the car and ordered to get out of the car. One of the car was blocking us here, one in front, one in the back. So it was like a big operation, like they were chasing big time criminals. And they dragged you all from the car? They dragged us all from the car, they put our hands on the uh, hood, spread our legs. Um, they were trying to get him out of the car. I, I didn't actually see it well because he was, I was standing my back to him. He was in the back over there behind my car. But uh, the, yes, in the end, they actually pulled him out of the car. There was a lot of screaming and uh, shouting. There was some woman passing by old woman and she said, what are you doing? Release, re let them go. They're not criminal, something like this. And then uh, there was a, a young guy with his girlfriend walking. So he took out his uh, cell phone and started filming this. And uh, two of the policemen who were arresting us were, jumped on him, pushed him to the ground, his face in the snow and starting bashing him quite professionally, so I thought they were not road police. They were definitely some secret services. They are not dangerous people, they are not criminals, anything like that. It's just, it, it's just a crackdown on opposition, and that's it. That's, that's all it comes down to. You start 
guessing what could be done to them. Are they being tortured in a physical way or psychologically? Mom received a note. It didn't sound like Andrei at all. I can absolutely guarantee that even if, if it was Andrei's hand, he was either dictated it or actually he was under influence of drugs because it just didn't sound right. In April 2011, a bomb ripped through a Minsk metro station just meters from Lukashenko's office. He was quick to call it terrorism and even pinned blame on the opposition. But what's even stranger is that Lukashenko took his young son to witness the carnage. Well, my explanation would be that he wanted to show him like what an enemy of the state can do to the people. They want to do you harm. Everybody is out to get you. Because this is something that is like his way of thinking. He's really thinking that all the world is out to get him. Even more sinister are the accusations that Lukashenko might have been behind this explosion himself, a way of persuading his people they are under threat, and he is the only man who can save them. There's been speculation about Lukashenko's mental health for some time. Before the presidential election, a prominent human rights lawyer asked the Central Election Committee and Supreme Court to look into whether Lukashenko was still fit to be commander-in-chief, but he was ignored. Diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks show the Americans have also had their concerns, referring to him as bizarre and disturbed. Lukashenko grew up in the east of Belarus, not far from the border with Russia. He was tormented at school for being illegitimate and was raised by his mother. And if Minsk feels like a step back in time, the Belarusian countryside resembles another era entirely. On the approach to Lukashenko's home village of Alexandria, the landscape changes dramatically. Dilapidated old shacks give way to modern and bright houses, all apparently with central heating and hot water, which is unusual in this part of the country, despite the harsh winters. And in the center of the village, where only 600 people live, a swanky hotel, though it's not clear who comes to visit. This really is the middle of nowhere. Perhaps Lukashenko's ego led him to believe his home would become a tourist hotspot, but no sign of that today. The whole place was eerily silent. Even the three million dollar bridge crossing 10 yards of river is hardly used. When Lukashenko lived here, he apparently hated using the ferry. It's a crossing that would have taken all of five minutes. There's clearly been high levels of investment in this area, investment that is not matched in the rest of the country. This is where Lukashenko lived with his mother. The original building was knocked down and rebuilt a good few years ago. He clearly looks after his own. Filming here is illegal, so it wasn't safe to get closer than this. Um, 
touched the humble by the honor of receiving this award on behalf of our friends and loved ones. And I'm extremely grateful to all of you for the support you're giving us and for all the help uh, that Index of Censorship is doing to help us to free our loved ones. And I, one of the slogans of my brother's campaign was, together we will win. And I'm appealing to you to join us in our fight for freeing our relatives and, and friends. Together we will win. Thank you very much. I think I hit the point when everything I'm doing feels pointless and probably that's why the voice has gone because the voice has gone, you know, that kind of impulse that it's not that I don't believe in what I'm doing, of course I do, but it's kind of every day 24-7 you're doing something and absolutely no results. These horrendous sentences are passed and, and people are still in jail and you know health is deteriorating of people and it's just unbearable to be in, in this such a long time because it's, it's just over three months and I think I just hit the point one probably just need some sort of inspiration to kick me again and get me going. Rural Belarus is traditionally where Lukashenko gets most of his support. He's seen as one of them, as a provider of stability, which is something Belarusians have historically craved. But this woman is no fan of Lukashenko. In tough economic times, she's struggling to survive and blames the president. You should know how to marry us. А что это не могут сделать, построить дом? Тут нас 20 человек каких-нибудь. Нача вам еще в допсе. У хати вода, у хати еда. Сами построили и надо платить за это. И разве это жизнь? Ну и какая это жизнь? А вы бы сделали нам. Тут вы вода у вас, тут вы отопление. Тут и отопление, тут вам спать. За нашу пенсию не надо ничего. И все сделают. This grandmother and others in her village who are too scared to go on camera definitely wanted change. It seems the core of Lukashenko's support is starting to disappear. Во, поднять не может баба, приспосабливается, кружечкой наливаю. А тогда я достану, отсыплю жменькой этой бульбы, что снять не могу. И жить надо. Помер гэткому, гэткой уже бабе, да и не, не живи. А лишь не помрешь. This is where a young Lukashenko made a name for himself. He managed this pig farm in Shklov. It's now closed and derelict. But this is where signs of Lukashenko's violent streak first began to show. Former workers here tell tales of being assaulted by Lukashenko, or Sasha, as he was known then. Today, he prefers the nickname Papa to Sasha. Президент Республики Беларусь Александр Григорьевич Лукашенко. There's a law in Belarus which means no business or organization can use the title of president. That's reserved for Lukashenko alone. Also, the media can only film him from the front. He apparently doesn't like to see his boldness from behind. 
how a man from a humble background like his rose to the top is a complicated story, one of oppression and manipulation. But it's how he's managing to stay there that's most worrying. Oleg Bebenin, seen here on the left, was presidential candidate Andrei Sanikov's campaign manager. Two months before the election, he was found hanging in his holiday home. The authorities say he killed himself. His friends and family say he was murdered. In 1999 and 2000, key opponents to Lukashenko disappeared. People spoke of death squads operating on the streets of Minsk. More than 10 years on, had they returned? Feeling his power start to slip away, was this the desperate attempt of Lukashenko to deter one of his main political opponents from standing against him? Lukashenko is said to hold grudges and seek revenge. Was this a threat to anyone who dare stand up for freedom and democracy in Belarus? In the spring of 2011, everyone's worst fears were confirmed. Those detained were being tortured and abused. Так что просто ужасно болели связки на ногах, и мы стояли фактически на шпагате. Так по 40 минут, и это все происходило, когда мы были голы. Тому лестницы в отдельное помещение начали поднимать руки, так что хрустели кости, и при этом требовать, чтобы я пообещал, что буду исполнять все, все, что мне говорят сотрудники комитета госбезопасности. И это остановилось, эти руки поднимали настолько высоко и так долго, пока я не сказал, что да, я буду все исполнять. И это такое проделывали со мной несколько раз. Я уже не вспоминаю про то, что, например, красили пол масляной, ацетонной, специальной краской, заставляли находиться в этом, в, в этом месте, заставляли голыми приседать по 20 раз, резко приседать по 20 раз, что для людей с плохим здоровьем было реальным издевательством. Это все происходило условием, единственным возможным условием моего освобождения под подписку о невыезде являлось то, чтобы я подписал бумагу о том, что я становлюсь тайным сотрудником КГБ. Не под воздействием пыток, а для того, чтобы заявить про все те преступления, которые там творятся, про все те пытки, я пошел на этот шаг. Я подписал документ о том, что становлюсь сотрудникам, тайным сотрудникам Комитета государственной безопасности. Но я хочу сказать, я никогда не был и не буду агентом КГБ. Shortly after this press conference, Alexei Mikhailovich was forced to flee Belarus. He was scared he'd be rearrested for exposing what's happening inside KGB prisons. This has always been Lukashenko's excuse for locking people up. On the night of the election, he says members of the opposition smashed up parliament and planned to storm it, like it was some kind of organized coup. But the presidential candidates tried to stop this violence and certainly had not ordered it. Activists even formed a line to try and keep back the crowds. The opposition says it was KGB officers who first broke the windows, encouraging others to follow suit, some sort of provocation giving Lukashenko an excuse to unleash the crackdown he'd been planning, probably from the start. После того, как провокаторы начали бить стекла, это послужило сигналом, я так понимаю, для спецподразделений, для для атаки, для нанесения удара по мирным по этой мирной акции. Leonid Navitsky was Andrei Sanikov's bodyguard. He managed to escape a KGB detention center and is now on the run, having left his wife and children behind in Belarus. He says he and Andrei Sanikov were deliberately targeted by security forces.
Я пытался, попытался за прикрыть его. Сам получил дубинкой по голове неоднократно. Ну, у меня шапка была, смягчила удар. Вот. Потом э, Андрей упал. Меньше избивали Андрея. А на мне был бронежилет, поэтому мне было проще. Вот. Нас уже упавших лупили дубинками, били дубинками, ногами. Потом нам просто прошлись и как бы оставили в покое. Когда я поднялся, Андрей, мне казалось, Андрей лежит без сознания, но он открыл глаза, я спросил, все ли нормально, он говорит, что повреждена нога, очень болит нога. Выглядел он очень, очень ужасно после этого. Before escaping the KGB, Leonid says officers have tried to force him to blame Andrei Sanikov for the post-election violence. Все сводилось к тому, чтобы я клеветал или что-то сказал плохое в адрес Санникова, что мол, я слышал, будто бы он призывал к насилию или что-нибудь в этом духе. Ну, конечно же, ничего такого я не, не, не сказал, потому что этого не было. Being apart from his family has been tough for Leonid. He's lost his hair through the stress of it. Back in Minsk, the KGB have begun to intimidate his wife and children. Security officers make menacing phone calls and carry out regular searches of their apartment. Я просто стараюсь при детях так не падать духом, хотя мне это, конечно, очень тяжело удается и Плачу я иногда при них, потому что не могу просто э, ну, сдерживать себя. И вот, ну и младшие, и старшие говорят, что мама, когда был папа, ты намного меньше плакала. Вот. А сейчас ты все время плачешь. Я говорю, ну вот, просто мы не можем друг без друга. Нам очень тяжело. Младшая, вот когда заболела сейчас, у нее горло болело, и даже очень тяжело было глотать. И она лежит и говорит, мама, я хочу чтобы пришла фея и исполнила три моих желания. Ну, я думаю, ну, какие у ребенка могут быть желания? Ну, там, кукла какая-нибудь, очередная игрушка. Я говорю, ну, и какое твое первое желание? Мое первое желание, чтобы я выздоровела. Я говорю, ну, это понятно. А второе? Второе желание, чтобы мы были вместе с папой. Я говорю, ну, хорошо. А третье? А третье мое желание, чтобы Санников был наш президент. Конечно, плохо. Скучаю. скучаю я, скучаю дети. Просто как бы я стараюсь не думать о том, что нам без него плохо. На данный момент как бы мы стараемся думать о том, что мы скоро будем вместе, потому что как бы планировать жизнь без него для нас это просто нереально. Как бы мы и не собираемся жить раздельно, чтобы он был все время там, а мы чтобы были все время здесь. То есть для нас, конечно, такая ситуация неприемлема. Ни он без нас не может, ни мы без него не можем. Andrei Sanikov has been held in prison since the election of December 2010. He was sentenced to five years. But in November 2011, his lawyers were suddenly denied access to him, and nobody's heard from him since. A month earlier, there had been disturbing revelations that fellow inmates had been issuing death threats to Andre. For the KGB to order or blackmail prisoners to turn on other inmates is nothing new, the perfect way of shifting responsibility and getting others to do their dirty work. Ren does not to know where he is because, you know, you, you kind of think the worst. Knowing what, um, you know, our um, regime is capable of, you're thinking the worst. 
Andre's lawyers requested he be put in isolation for his own safety, but an inmate with TB was placed in the cell too. It was a deliberate attempt to make him ill, to weaken him, or worse. Andre has always refused to beg Lukashenko for a pardon. The fear is Lukashenko won't back down. Andre has been tortured, so yes, I'm pretty sure that it's going on now. Uh, might be physical torture, might be psychological torture, but nevertheless, it's happening all the time. Irina's trying hard to continue with her life. She's been campaigning for her brother's release for over a year, and it's been an extremely difficult period. But she's learning to cope. Yeah, I think human being is a very resilient thing. <laughs> and of course, you learn to survive. And um, I've realized uh, fairly early in the year that to be able to keep fighting for Andrei, I have to find a way of coping with the situation. Even with what's going on with, with Andre, before we couldn't have conversations about Andre without, without you. Without, without me crying, crying all the time. No, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, you, you learn. Um, yeah, I've learned to, you know, to, to put it sort of aside and, and just get on what I have to do, as hard as it is. It's much easier to break into tears and you know, feel sorry for myself, but actually it's not me who's in trouble, it's Andrei who's in trouble. So in a way I feel that I don't even have right to cry because what I'm going through is nothing in comparison. So what am I complaining about? I'm, I have to fight and I have, you know, it's easier for me because I can do something about the situation and I am doing it. He unfortunately can't do anything. He just have to put up with things that are imposed on him. Do you, do you worry that you might never see him again? No. No, I will see him and it will happen soon.